Self-discovery in the life of the desert is the discovery of who you actually are. The burden that lays on you can be quite considerable. Because to discover before God who you really are is less cozy than it might sound. We live in a world where self-discovery and self-expression sound wonderful. If only everybody else would go away, if only everybody else would stop telling me what to do, then I'd be so marvelous. Then my self would flower wonderfully in all its creativity and beauty and complexity. Yes, say the Desert Fathers. But the trouble is that if everybody else were taken away, you wouldn't have a clue who you were. And finding out who you were in the eyes of God would actually be a long and painful job. Again and again, in the literature of the desert, you come up against that fundamental principle, self-criticism, which says to you, I haven't yet found who I am. I can't express myself because I don't know who I am yet. And what I want to express, and what feels like honesty and rampant integrity and deep creativity, is actually very, very likely to be just another manifestation of all those rather trivial, rather self-seeking motivations which I'd like to think I've left behind. Very briefly put, it's letting go of self-justification. That particular kind of creating one's own image and one's own selfhood that will justify oneself, that will enable oneself to say, well, I've made it now, I can relax. Only the mystery of God is going to tell me who I am. And that facing that mystery in its fullness is going to require of me an enormous dispossession of the things that look as if they're going to tell me who I am. John the Dwarf, Abba John said, we have put the light burden on one side, that is to say, self-accusation, and we have loaded ourselves with a heavy burden, self-justification. Self-justification is, in fact, something inimical to the true self. Self-accusation, that is self-questioning, self-criticism, is the lighter burden, strange as it may sound. Self-expression, self-discovery, self-realization. Since we have no idea at the beginning what that self is, this becomes a journey in the dark, a journey of labor, pain, and patience. Abbot Isidore the priest writes about the danger of being guided by our hearts. Now that sounds rather strange. It's the wisdom of the saints, said Abbot Isidore, to recognize the will of God. And it is in obeying the truth that a human being surpasses everything else, being the image and likeness of God. But of all evil suggestions, the most terrible is that of following one's own heart. How we would love to be able to say, following our own heart, following our truth, following our dream, is what it's all about. Because following one's own heart without the critical edge of the truth in which alone we become the image and likeness of God is a path to disaster. It must be God who tells me who I am, not the hidden agenda of my ego or yours. I would like to tell myself who I am, I would like to tell you who you are, and sometimes I would like you to tell me who I am. So in human relations we become locked more and more tightly into a sort of vast collusion, a collective fantasy about the truth. We long for someone else to confirm what we are to support our needs, the agenda of our ego. In the world of the desert, stepping back from all that is the necessary path to truth. And sometimes in the desert world, the desert fathers often speak of that weeping for our failure, our failure to be open to the God who will tell us who we are, our failure to become who God wants us to be, who God sees us as being. We live these days in a society that is both deeply individualist and deeply conformist. Our society is fascinated by the individual will. We find it quite strange as a society to think of lives that are not shaped by the exercise of will and choice. And we regard choice frequently as the highest possible good. So we like the idea of the mature human being being in a position to impose his or her will 
by absolute free choice on the environment. And at the same time, we are deeply conformist. Because choice is in fact managed for us very, very efficiently by an immense system of consumer provision. Maximizing choices means maximizing the products that somebody is in fact designing for you. And that means at the end of the day that our choices are always and already channeled into conformist patterns. Choice as such, just the capacity to say yes or no, that is in fact one of the least personal things about us. The person who really has matured as a person is perhaps the person who thinks least about choice. Strange to say this, but it casts for me quite a lot of light on the mystery of the free will of Jesus. Theologians have often argued about whether Jesus had human free will in the sense that we do, as if somehow Jesus would be less human if at every point of his life he didn't face exactly the same range of consumer choice as we do. So, in the Garden of Gethsemane, what was going on? Was Jesus really faced with the kind of human choice we might have to stay or to run? Or did he have to do what he did? But there is a very profound sense in which in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus didn't have a choice because of who he was. Because of having matured in steady fidelity to God the Father. The choice to betray would have been a violation of everything that he was. A tearing of the very fabric of his being. If you think about people whose moral and spiritual integrity has mattered to you, if you think about what their lives are like, you may very well recognize what's going on here. These are people who, it may be, don't need to choose very much because they've become habituated to seeing and responding in certain ways. We, very often, struggling down in the foothills, need the disciplines of choosing, need to be very self-aware about what's going on. But perhaps, when spiritual maturity arrives, there isn't very much choice. And that's not a diminution, but an expansion of the personal. Because here is someone who, by a long and hard route, has become someone whose seeing and responding is instinctively truthful. You don't have to think about it. You have become habituated to seeing and responding truthfully. The person is something more, something more than the ego. That integral response to truth, which is something deeper than satisfying a system of wants. A sort of unspoken theme that I have in mind is how all of this, this sense of the authentically human, depends and can only depend on the quality of our silence, the need to let go of words in certain ways, that willingness to occupy a space before God which is not a defended territory, defended against God or against anyone else. And because we occupy a space that isn't a defended territory, it's space both for God and for each other. We are moving beyond our fascination, our hypnosis by the ideas of choice and individuality as conceived in the modern world, moving towards the possibility of a human life characterized by consistent, instinctive responsiveness to the truth, acquiring an instinctive taste for truth. A taste for truth. That's to say, an appetite for what is real, so strong that it allows us constantly to keep ourselves in question, under scrutiny, not in an obsessional way, just going on asking who is being served here, the ego or the truth. <laughs>